like my whole orientation towards problems in my life was that that I would figure out, you know, and you think this is a good thing, right? To be like, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm positive, I'm going to solve this. And he kind of said, Cheryl, you're really a good problem solver. And that is fantastic for problems that are solvable. <laughs> but do you think all of your problems in life are solvable? And I was like, yeah, they have to. Because I'm not real. I wasn't willing to confront the fact that like, you know, that he's like, but you know that you kind of know, we know that they aren't, right? We know that, you know, shit happens, you know? So it's yeah. funny how we know it on one hand, but we don't want to. It's like, we're it's an elephant in the room, right? So, you know, he, that was the first kind of, prodding, uh, he kind of changed or opened my mind to the possibility of acceptance and commitment therapy. If you want to learn how you can live better with PMDD, this podcast was created for you. This is Mindfulness for PMDD with Diane. I'm Diane and I'm a registered dietitian and lactation consultant. I'm also a mom, a PMDD warrior, and a trauma-informed mindfulness teacher. And this is where I discuss topics related to PMDD through the lens of mindfulness and meditation, and where I share all about how mindfulness has gotten me to a place of greater peace and acceptance with my PMDD. I also chat with people who have helped and inspired me along the way, so they can share their wisdom with you too. So let's get started. This podcast is not a substitute for psychological therapy or medical advice. Please take care when listening to this podcast, as some may find certain words or subjects triggering or difficult to hear. Take only what serves you and leave the rest behind. Friends, this is a robust episode. My guest, Cheryl Crow, is an occupational therapist who lives with rheumatoid arthritis and runs a support group for others living with chronic illness. She also practices and applies acceptance and commitment therapy into her own life and in her work. In our chat, Cheryl shares about her diagnosis story and experience with medical gaslighting, how she came to run a support group for people with rheumatoid arthritis and chronic illness, the mental health journey of living and thriving with chronic illness, even when you are still in discomfort after trying all the things in your toolbox, and how acceptance is different from resignation. Cheryl Crow is a fierce advocate for meeting the full picture of patients' needs beyond joint pain. After living with rheumatoid arthritis for over a decade and becoming an occupational therapist, Cheryl founded Arthritis Life with the mission of educating, empowering, and supporting people with arthritis. Cheryl is known for her entertaining yet educational videos featuring arthritis life hacks, product demonstrations, and insights into the psychosocial aspects of life with invisible chronic illness. She created and hosts the Arthritis Life podcast and runs the on-life self-management course and support group, Room to Thrive, where she helps people adjust to their conditions and live full and meaningful lives. Y'all, this was such an educational and entertaining chat. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Cheryl Crow. So I am so happy to have Cheryl Crow here with me today. Welcome, Cheryl. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Thank you for being here. I'm so glad this worked out because I'm super excited to chat with you today. (laughs) Yeah, me too. So Cheryl, let's jump right in if that's okay with you. Yes. I would love if you could start us off just sharing a little bit about yourself and especially your own chronic illness journey and what it is you do. Yeah. So I... I'm 42 years old, and I have officially this year been living with rheumatoid arthritis exactly half of my life because I was diagnosed at age 21. So like many people with autoimmune conditions, it's very hard for me to condense my diagnosis journey because it was so... I I call it like a saga. Like I actually have a YouTube video that's 40 minutes long just talking about my diagnosis experience because it 
involved, you know, medical gaslighting and being shuffled between different doctors and all this stuff. But the, just to synopsize, to attempt to, you know, I was a very healthy, active child and teen. I was playing, you know, I was a captain of my college soccer team, division three, but, but I was, you know, I weighed 130 pounds and a lot of that was muscle. And the reason I mentioned my weight wasn't that big of a deal to me at the time, but is that I started, what I would, what I said is I feel like I'm wasting away. Like something was off, completely off in my body starting around my sophomore year of college. And I started losing weight, losing my appetite. And then I had this one joint that hurt. And that is a typical presentation for rheumatoid arthritis. Usually a hallmark sign is that you have multiple joints hurting on both sides of the body that are the small joints of your fingers, toes, wrists, ankles. But so I just had this one sprain. I call it my, I call it my sprain finger. Okay. This is too long. Long story <laughs> short. So I went through doctor to doctor to doctor, but I was mostly looking at my GI issue. I was looking at gastrointestinal, you know, a gastroenterologist because of the weight, unintended weight loss. Weight. Yeah. Yeah. And of course the gaslighting came in when they kept, they actually called my parents and said, we think she's hiding an eating disorder. Like we don't know why she was, should be losing weight. Well, it turns out that unintended weight loss can be a, a symptom of what's called rheumatoid cachexia, which is mm. the muscle wasting and what so you lose weight through your muscles wasting weight, which is exactly what I was saying. I felt like I'm wasting. What is yes. happening? So long story short, that was a very, you know, I would say traumatic experience with like a small T, like it wasn't, you know, I, it was, it was really difficult for me. And yeah, finally can got I, my diagnosis. Can I ask time. you? Yes. Because yes, yes. now the dietitian brain yeah. part of me is very intrigued. Why, or do we know why the cachexia happens related to the rheumatoid arthritis? I don't know all the science of it other than when I've tried to read a little more about it, you know, because I am an occupational therapist, which is the health provider, but we don't always have to know the same degree of like what's going on at the cellular level as like, you know, a registered dietitian or like a rheumatologist, but is that something to do with the kinds of um, inflammatory cells that are released when your immune systems are attacking the lining of your synovial joints? That inflammation doesn't stay in the joints, you know, travels throughout the body. And for some reason, it tends to destroy the muscle tissue. Okay. And so, yeah. And so it's, it's, it's complicated. So autoimmune diseases, they're complicated tagline. So I ended up <laughs> getting diagnosed actually before my RA diagnosis, I was also diagnosed with gastroparesis. So for, sorry, I forgot to tell you that earlier, but so that's a disorder that, you know, it goes under the umbrella of dysautonomia disorders of the autonomic nervous system, but at the time, I kind of, in my head, I wrapped that up with a tidy bow because that actually resolved once I got treatment for my rheumatoid arthritis. Oh. So my so my explanation for that at the time was my body was just super off because I had this uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis inflammation and it somehow sparked my GI system to like shut down. But once I got the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, my GI system was like, woohoo, I gained back the weight. I was feeling robust yeah. again. And, and, you know, I felt, and I, my, my, yeah, my treatment journey was initially very linear and that I went on medications and the medications are very effective for rheumatoid arthritis for the majority of people. And so I, I went into what's called medicated remission. So I Mm, had for mm -hmm. the first six years after my diagnosis, I didn't have a lot of any signs, quote unquote, of active disease. I was able to resume my prior level of activities. I was dancing, I was playing soccer, I was running around, you know, I finished college. And then in the subsequent, so that was the first Cheryl, season. can yeah. we back yeah. up real oh, quick? Please. Yeah, yeah. Because um, just for the listener, I want to clarify. So gastroparesis is a slowing of the digestive system. Mm-hmm. So you are experiencing gastrointestinal issues before your diagnosis. Yes, yeah. You've got muscle wasting. Mm-hmm. You've got well, in your case, you said one, a quote unquote one, strained finger. Yeah, <laughs> your strained yeah. finger, which really was an ongoing joint. Yes, pain infl- caused by, I guess, inflammation. Yeah, that is like so. It was in my knuckle, my right knuckle, and that's typically they called the MCP, the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Uh-huh. That's what rheumatoid arthritis tends to attack the most. Okay, followed by the PIPs, the proximal inter- interphalangeals. Okay, the very last joint in your finger, the tip near the tip, that's called the distal interphalangeal, the dips, DIP, and those are tend to be actually not affected in rheumatoid, but are affected in osteoarthritis. So that's one of the things doctors look at for the quote unquote differential diagnosis. Yes. What's going on here. So 
if a tr- if I had seen a rheumatologist earlier on, they probably would have seen, oh, this might be the mm. early stages of rheumatoid arthritis. Got it. Because it's not typical for uh, somebody at my age at that time to have, you know, swelling and pain in the in the knuckle joint yeah. that's ongoing for months and months. But again, as an athlete, I was used to pushing through pain. I just didn't yes. think of it. And yeah. so once you got your diagnosis and you began treatment, the GI stuff and the weight and muscle wasting seemed to better. reverse. Yeah. Everything got yeah, better. I, I want to say just for the record, again, I don't know how many people care, but I did that a week before my diagnosis, I woke up with every single joint in my body hurt. Like I Ooh. couldn't open, I couldn't open my hand out of a fist. And that was, that was the canary in the coal mine for my doctors to figure out it was rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. But they had initially said, again, they kept saying, harping on this idea that I had an eating disorder and it was so frustrating. Sorry. I'm still mental. No, I've like, gone that- to therapy and like processed this. It is really I just, my heart goes out to anyone listening who's been medically gaslit like that because yes. it is, the analogy I use is like, it's like my house was on fire and I called the fire department and they're like, we're going to diagnose you with something called your house is not on fire, but you yeah. think it is like, you know, thinking I'm a hypochondriac. So it's yeah. both things. I thought I was a hypochondriac and concurrently hiding an eating disorder. Right. And I was like, I need help. Like I'm a, and I, I just, for the record, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm such a, I'm so hyper. No, 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 no. Yeah. This is so important yeah. because so many people go through this and we're not just talking RA or PMDD. So many people yes. go through this medical gaslighting and it's just, yes. I can't even put into words all the emotions that you go through because these are the people you are looking to for the answers. These are the people you feel like you should be able to trust who yeah. you feel like should be able to see the full picture and listen to you and take everything into account and give you some kind of answer you can work with. And then you get, in some cases, the exact opposite. Yeah. And, and where do you turn from there? Where exactly. And I had absolutely, like, if you look at, you know, any history of trauma or anything else like that, I had nothing that could explain what was going on. I had extremely good family support, extremely good friend support, no strong family history. Like, so, in a, you know, a lot of times doctors will look at what could be, what's, you know, if we hear hoof, hoof beats, think horses, not zebras, what's the most logical explanation. Right. And for me, it was so frustrating because I was like, look, like literally there is no other reason. Something is wrong in my body. I actually thought that like, maybe I have stomach cancer or something. But then of course, and then you start saying, well, I'm worried I might have cancer. And the doctors already decide you're a hypochondriac. Right. Then you just continue being labeled as a hypochondriac. It's very, right. it's really, really hard. So, so you, you put, you put it perfectly. Yeah. Where do you turn to? Right. You know, fortunately, my parents believed me the whole time. Unfortunately, just for the record, my extended family has a history of eating disorders. Mm. You know, I don't really want to go into the, all the specifics on yeah. that because it's not my story to tell. But so, I mean, I think objectively, I think the doctors were correct to consider that as a possibility. Sure. But I think it's very unethical to say that your only possibility or you're going to consider is that someone's lying to you. I'm like, right. I remember I was, I actually went to my study. I went and did my study abroad because I'm very stubborn. So in junior year, I was feeling really crappy, but I just decided I'm going to feel crappy in Seattle uh, or New York where I was going to school. I'm from Seattle. I'm going to either feel bad in, in New York or I'm going to feel bad in Australia. <laughs> I might as well go to Australia. This is my right. dream. <laughs> and I remember uh, in little, we were in this like little Italy neighborhood of Melbourne and I just, this really sticks in my head really strongly. And so I'm sorry if this I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but I saw like these this couple that were like pretty clearly overweight and eating gelato. And I remember staring at them and just being like, I would give anything to just be able to eat gelato. Like I yeah. enjoy food. Yeah. I don't enjoy restricting. I don't enjoy restricting di- my diet. I don't enjoy I'm not into it really. I just I like to just, you know, I like to eat healthy, but I just felt like feel I felt very misunderstood. So anyway, yeah. leading me eventually to learn about, you know how to accept the things out of my control and learning how to you know, cope with all that. Because whether it's medical gaslighting or something else, there are things that, you know, are going to be out of our control in our yes. lives. Yeah. And we are 100% going to get to talking about yes. acceptance. But I want to bring you back because you were taking us Thank through you. your chronic illness journey. And you were saying that you got into 
a sort of, I think you called it like treatment mediated remission. It's or... called medicated remission. You can medicated basically remission. either be in medicated or unmedicated remission. Yeah. It's just, it yeah. just means I didn't have any, like no joint inflammation. My blood mark, my blood work all looked good, you know, yeah. but I still have the disease. I still, it's not like cancer where like, you don't have cancer anymore. You're in remission. Right. You still have rheumatoid arthritis, but it's, it, it is like dormant. Yes. And what yeah. happened between that point in time and ultimately, you know, where you're doing what you're doing today, which is supporting other yeah. people with RA? Yeah. You know, like chapter one of my story was, you know, straightforward. It was like, I thought this was like the hero's journey. Like I climbed the mountain of rheumatoid arthritis, took my medicine, figured out the solution, went back down. The second part was it's complicated. <laughs> chapter <Yeah>. two <laughs> is like, it's most autoimmune diseases are, they kind of, they're not so linear. They often, you flare up and then you go for the remissions. You get worse and better and worse and better. And so that was kind of characterized my treatment journey the next 15 years. And so for me, I ended up, you know, deciding to career-wise become an occupational therapist. I always wanted to be a teacher or, and, and, but I actually was really interested in helping children with what used to be called special needs, you know, developmental disabilities mm -hmm. and such. And so if you don't know what occupational therapy is, it's like, we're like, I, I, I would rename us life skills therapists. We really are like the original life coaches or like if a occupation or if a physical therapist and a psychologist had a baby, because we actually have mental health training and we directly can work in exclusively mental health settings. Like I did mm. an internship in inpatient psychiatry okay. but, uh, and which is oh, PTs do not do and cannot do under their license, or we can work in physical rehab. So we really work on like the inner, like the ability of the person to function better in their daily life, you know, given their illness, injury, disability. So it's a very creative right. problem solving field. And when I was going through school from the years 2010 to 2012, I learned so much about how to manage my rheumatoid arthritis that I had never been taught before. And I thought, I kept thinking to myself, like, why, why are patients only just given these 15 minute appointments with their rheumatologist once every three months? Like there was things, I'll just give an example about as taught, right? I was taught joint protection techniques, like in, in, in layman's terms, life hacks, you know, adaptations and compensatory strategies or life hacks to protect my joints to function yeah. better in daily life. and I call mental life hacks, coping tools, coping with uncertainty, coping also with, or also managing fatigue. Fatigue is something that really distinguishes rheumatoid arthritis from the like, kind of mechanical osteoarthritis and that it's a systemic full body condition. So I kept saying someone has to like, I, I went to OT school, I had my blinders on. I'm going to help kids with developmental disabilities, but someone needs to figure out how to help <laughs> people with arthritis. Someone needs to do it. And I got, at, you know, in the 2000s, I got tired of keeping hearing myself saying that. And so I eventually formed my own solution to, you know, they say entrepreneur, somebody who, yeah. thought, you know, <laughs> discovers a problem and decides to make a solution. So in 2019, right before the, you know, 20, November, 2019, I registered my website, registered my organization thinking I'm going to do this on the side while I still work as a you know, pediatric occupational therapist in the school system. And again, have my blinders on for that. And this, which was great. It was great for the time being. And I was like, I'm, you know, my mission with arthritis life is to educate, empower, and support people with inflammatory forms of arthritis, you know, the autoimmune types. Yes. And so when the pandemic hit, I was like, okay, well, I'm not going back to the schools because I, I don't, I'm immuno, I'm immunosuppressed with my medications. And okay. so I needed to take care of, and it was just, you know, and, and I had a, you know, six-year-old kindergartner at the time. I know your son's a little younger, yes. than mine, but it's, it was hard, right? To figure out how you're going to balance everything. So then I developed my own comprehensive What's called a self management program. It's really an empowerment program, a self paced course called Rim to Thrive. And then there's also a support group option for that where I do online support groups for four months. And it's been really great. So, yeah, I love talking about that. So, I'm happy to talk more about that. But oh, that's so cool. That's how it all happened. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, the way <laughs> that I discover or, you know, found out about you and what you're doing is I heard you talking on another podcast about yes. acceptance. And yes. this is where I got so excited and was like, I need to talk to this person. Because over time, I have been putting more and more acceptance and commitment principles into my own program for people with PMDD. And I get so excited about it. But I feel like I haven't quite yet hit the nail on the head of like, how I want to talk about it. 
you know? Mm-hmm. And what I found with you was I just got so excited hearing you talk about it, hearing you say, you know, talk about some of the things that I've experienced and just the kind of the way you wrap it up and put it into words. And I said, I need to chat with this person and like nerd out with this person over act. (laughs) That's like my favorite thing to do. So when you email me, you're like, I don't know if you would want to do this. I'm like, yes, Uh, yes, I would. (laughs) This is my favorite thing to do. Yeah. (laughs) So obviously I could, I could do this too, but I would love if you could maybe usher into this topic with like, your own way that you Mm -hmm. like to explain what ACT is. Mm -hmm. And also, because I think the first people think, first thing people think when they hear acceptance is like, like, exactly. (laughs) There's really a PR problem. Every important thing I've ever been involved with has a PR problem. Like occupational therapy, it's not just about getting people jobs. You know, a rheumatoid arthritis, it's not actually just arthritis. It's not just joint right. It's a systemic autoimmune condition. Right. You know, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Ew, I don't want to accept things. Ugh. That's actually not really about what you think acceptance means. Yeah. Because I think that our first response when they, we hear acceptance is like, oh, so just giving up, yeah. rolling over, not yeah. trying anymore, right? Yes. So, so for you, like, what does acceptance and commitment therapy mean? Yeah. And I didn't, so yeah, when we say ACT, it stands for acceptance and commitment therapy. I first learned, I didn't learn about this in OT school. I learned about it in through my own therapist. And so when I was going to, I started therapy when my son was about one year old and I thought, oh, again, because I had this stubborn, I had this stubborn, (laughs) stubbornness and optimism, the two things that get you the farthest in life and also can really get you to some bad places because you know you're like I'm (laughs) stubborn enough to think that this and optimistic enough to think that like I'm gonna solve this problem that's unsolvable so long story short yeah I was like I'm just gonna go for a few months to therapy to like figure out post this is probably just postpartum anxiety and then flash forward four years later still going to therapy (laughs) at the time so now I do like check-ins but the therapist basically you know he explained that well he made me confront the fact that not all problems in life are solvable. And I know it sounds so simple when you put it that way, but I'm like, no, 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 no. I just need to solve it. Like my whole orientation towards problems in my life was that that I would figure out, you know, and you think this is a good thing, right? To be like, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm positive. I'm going to solve this. And he kind of said, Cheryl, you're really a good problem solver. And that is fantastic for problems that are solvable. <laughs> but do you think all of your problems in life are solvable? And I was like, yeah, I am, they have it. Because I'm not real. I wasn't willing to confront the fact that like, you know, that he's like, but you know that you kind of know, we know that they aren't, right? We know that it happens, <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's funny how we know it on one hand, but we don't want to. You know, he that was the first kind of prodding. Uh, he kind of cha- changed or open my mind to the possibility of acceptance and commitment therapy. And then he recommended that I read The Happiness Trap by a psychologist named Dr. Russ Harris, who is the nicest person. I feel like he's my friend. He's not. He doesn't know I exist. (laughs) He does have a, he has a free Facebook group called like the Happiness Trap Discussion Group. If you're not on that, he will answer questions. Like he, anyway, so that's not the point. The point is that he explains ACT in a way that really made sense to me. And he said, so you asked the question, what is ACT and what is the difference between acceptance and resignation? So ACT, you know, is, I'm going to go first with what does acceptance mean in ACT? Mm-hmm. It, the definition that he said that really stuck with me is it doesn't mean liking what's happening in the present moment. It means taking what's offered. Yeah. So in the present moment. So life is offering you pain right now if you have arthritis, right? Joint inflammation, joint pain. Life is offering me uncertainty. Life is also offering me a lot of beautiful things. And so from the mindfulness standpoint, it's taking what's offered, making, and then actively making space for it, allowing. And that was a word I actually, allowing was even harder for me than accepting. Mm. You know, I'm going to allow this? No, I'm going to beat it back with a <laughs> stick. The, the analogy they use is like when you or, or one of the analogies, ACT is full of metaphors and analogies, you know, that I, I'm very visual, yeah. so I find it very helpful, but it's like a beach ball. Like, let's say all your problems or the things that are making you uncomfortable are like a beach ball and you're in the water and you keep trying to stuff it under the water and just keeps 
you know, putting <laughs> coming back up. You're used, you're ending up wasting all this energy trying to submerge it and make it go away. What if you just let the beach ball just be beside you yeah. in the water and keep going towards what's important in your life? So that's the commitment part. So you say you accept a the A part of act is accepting, allowing, making space for mm-hmm. your thoughts, feelings, sensations exactly as they are in the present. Not that you think that they're always going to be that way or thinking that, you know, there's no hope for the future being better, but you say, I'm going to take a moment to allow the present moment to be just what it is and make space for that. Then you connect. And it's not just about acceptance. People focus on that word, but act. The C part is commitment. Can then you connect with your values and you commit to taking effective action towards your values. And, and I'll say just one more quote from the book where he says, first, you make room for your thoughts and feelings, allow them to be exactly as you are. Then you ask, what can I do right now that is truly meaningful or important? This is very different from asking, how can I feel better? Then once you've identified an activity, you truly value, go ahead and take action. And that was this paradigm shift for me. Cause it's like, when you're sick, when you're chronically ill, a lot of your life becomes about how to feel better. Yes. Or if you have anxiety, which it turns out, I do actually have, you know, clinical uh, generalized anxiety disorder. And I've learned how, you know, to, I've learned that ACT is really helpful for coping with, with that as well. And so you say, instead of saying, well, how can I make my anxiety go away? How do I make these uncomfortable thoughts go away? You say, how can I proceed forward in life alongside these thoughts? These, yes. these, these anxious thoughts are just along for the ride now, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's, been, it's been a really wonderful, it frees up your energy. If all your energy is spent trying to fix and solve everything. I mean, I think, I think, you know, with your experience as, di- as a registered dietitian, that's where I see it happen a lot in the autoimmune community. People make their whole lives about like, I have to control my inflammation. I have to control my inflammation mm. through my diet. And I have to have the perfect diet. And, blah, and they're so stressed. First of all, they're, sh- they're just trading one inflammation for another. <laughs> Maybe you're eating anti-inflammatory, but now you're so stressed about what you're right. eating. You, your stress is inflammatory. So you're still inflamed. And then, and you're also like, your whole life becomes about food and it doesn't become about like, what is the purpose? The purpose of your health promoting behaviors in the case of food is to enable a quality of life. Well, what if you can have a good quality of life without everything that you eat being perfect? Yes. What if you can have a quality of life that is good for you and take, you know, engage in what's important and have a vibrant existence with pain? Hey, PMDD friend. If you want to be the first to know when a new episode is coming out, head to the show notes to join the Mindfulness for PMDD email list. I'll send you a heads up when I've scheduled a new episode to be published. I'll also give you sneak peeks at topics I'm working on and guests that I've booked. And maybe you can even submit your requests and suggestions for upcoming episodes. Get on the list at the show notes below this episode. Yes. Yes. Oh my God, there's so much I want to jump into here. So one of my favorite mindfulness teachers says that the aim of mindfulness and the aim of act is not to feel better, but to get better at feeling. Yep. Meaning, how can we, just as you said, take what's offered and allow it in? And as you said, we don't have to like it. (laughs) We don't always have to be happy and going, Oh, this is great. I love what life is offering right now. But kind of bring it into the fold, work with it, bring it along for the ride. And in doing so, we are, as you said, expending less energy. And now we can see more clearly those things that are most important to us in life, and bring those to the forefront. And yeah. make those yes. sort of the priority as opposed to all the fighting. <laughs> yeah. That's what it really was a what was the word I was gonna use? It it was a really transformative experience to say, instead of predicating my happiness on, oh, I have to achieve this perfect state of health before I can be happy, you know, right. before I can have a good life. To say, like, oh, well, people and it's actually it's actually goes sorry, everything intersects, right? Because it's also actually about you know, ableism and counteracting your own internalized ableism in the case of people with a chronic illness. Because I think part of the messaging we get through our culture is that, well, the only way to have a good life is to like be inspirational and overcome your challenge, right? right? You have to be the inspirational person who she has arthritis, but she didn't let it hold her back. And she is like, no, it holds me back from certain things. And I'm okay with that. Or I'm maybe I don't like it, but I'm going to have an awesome life despite that. 
instead of conforming to like an able-bodied standard. So that's a whole other yes. element. But, I was yeah. thinking about that the other day. We have so many hero stories about people who like just got through and did it. And mm-hmm. do you know what? Actually, maybe they didn't do what we think they did, but that's the story that we hold up is yeah. like the person who overcame and did all these huge wonderful things and they just, they got through it. And yeah. it is also, and it is a hero story to yeah. be able to say, this is what life gave me. I'm going to bring it along for the ride and I'm going to find the way to have that and still live a rich and meaningful life that aligns yeah. with the things that are most important to me. Yes. I, I think it really comes down to understanding or having a balance between the fixing mindset and the adapting and compensating and accepting mindset. Because it is, like my therapist said, like Dr. Hare says, if you have a problem, like let's say, you know, you let's say I have really bad hand pain. I woke up with bad hand pain. And there is a technique I have tried in the past that's in my pain management toolbox that is, you know, taking a warm shower or putting a warm compress on my hands or using compression gloves. The goal is not to be like, I'm just going to accept what life is offering right now and not do anything. (laughs) You know, that is elements of what you're experiencing. If they're solvable, it is worthwhile to put your energy towards that. But we also, what I, what I find in my work with the support groups of people with rheumatoid arthritis and similar is that most people the, you know the world around them is 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 giving them this message that it's all about the fixing it's all about the right. you know get the anti-inflammatory diet do exercise so that you manage your condition and it's hilarious because as an occupational therapist again we definitely want people to be able to achieve the you know the best state of health that they can but part of that entails in your mental health journey it entails being able to say okay sometimes i'm going to do everything I can and still have a flare up. What do I do then? You know, if yes. I, yeah. And so we, we counter, we have to have both tools in, again, in OT, we call them remedial strategies versus compensatory. So remediation is like, you know, you fix the problem, like your hand hurts, you do the hot compress. It doesn't right. hurt anymore. Where well, like the hot compress is actually technically compensatory because you're not actually fixing it, but you know, the medications are remedial. Like they like take away the disease in some ways. They, they, suppress uh, disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs to so make the disease not progress but the compensatory strategies are okay i've done the tools in my toolbox and they're not, i'm still experiencing discomfort or something that i don't like whether it's pain whether it's fatigue there it doesn't mean that okay oh well we say okay well there's tools we can cope use to cope with that and right. then there's a benefit to practicing that that kind of commitment therapy part of act where you say okay now what can I still do, you know, with this? I th- I had a I had an occupational therapist from New Zealand, Dr. Bronnie Lennox Thompson. She she came, was on my one of my first podcast episodes ever in 2020, and she asked a question that I'm. It's honestly, st- she's an an expert in self management for chronic pain in general, not just arthritis related pain. And she said that she has, she posed a question that kind of has been still kicking around my mind for like the four years since the interview, which is, she said when I run my chronic pain groups, I ask people what would you do if pain wasn't a problem for you? Mm. Isn't that an interesting question? I love it. I'm like, but pain, like it kind of hurts my brains. I'm like, but pain is a problem. Like intrinsically, right? As human beings, our evolution has prepared us to think the whole purpose of pain is to tell you there is a problem here. Tissue is being damaged. You need to take action, get away, you know, take your hand off the hot stove. But chronic pain, there's a lot of complexity to chronic pain. There's different kinds of chronic pain. There's neuropath, you know, pain from nerves, pain from inflammation. And then there's there's central sensitization, which is like in the case of like fibromyalgia, where your brain is legitimately giving you the sensation of pain, but the tissues are not damaged at all. Okay. And so you have to learn how to say, okay, well, what what can I still do with this pain? So yes. so anyway, there's kind of there's physical pain, but then there's psychological pain. And I think the beauty of ACT is that it, it helps with both of those, you know. Yes. It's with both kinds of pain. I love that. So I know you mentioned that you learned about ACT through your therapist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Dr. Russ Harris. Uh, And Dr. Russ Harris. (laughs) Since I'm an occupational Um, therapist, I took some of his professional development courses as well. Okay. 
um, right. including like act as a brief intervention, which was really interesting. Like it okay. was actually meant for like primary care settings, like so okay. brief interventions. Yeah. So what I'm curious is how you started to fold act into your life. Yeah. And then what I'm, I'm making the assumption, right? But I can say what oh, benefits, if any, did yeah. act have in your life beyond RA? Oh. When I, yeah, you sent me, first of all, you're very organized. You're an amazing podcast host. And I can say that because <laughs> I'm a podcast host too. So I know how it takes a lot of, it's like a duck on gliding over the water. This takes a lot of work to make it look, you know, natural and effortless. But you, you know, I loved, you sent me this question ahead of time. I really liked it because mm. I, it made me reflect and re- remember something I hadn't thought about for a while, which is, so I started learning about ACT when my son was like two years old. So I'm going to answer it in opposite order. So I, I, it helped me so much as a parent, actually. Okay. And there's an element alongside, I think, I think act along with direct, like explicit self-compassion exercises is like a dream team, right? Because there is kind of a implied compassion in act. But if you do, you know, I also, I forget how to be honest, but I, I somehow got, you know, may, maybe my therapist actually told me, but Kristen Neff, you know, self-compassion, yeah guru. I, she also spoke, I go to a lot of conferences. So she spoke, I think at one of the chronic pain conferences about, you know, self-compassion, giving ourselves the same kindness and care, you know, we would give to a good friend and realizing how often in my life I, as a parent would have these kind of really negative judgments about myself, kind of like the shoulder angel versus the shoulder devil or yes. shoulder angel, you know, but saying, you know, like, gosh, why can't you just get it together? Or like, why aren't you more patient? Like, and it was anyway, it was a real mind shift or really mind challenging, <laughs> anxiety ridden for me because I'm really good at working with challenging children, actually, like children who are behaviorally challenging, kids who can't, you know, tolerate or who aren't appropriate for like a public school setting and have to go to school. I've always been actually really, I felt competent at taking care of challenging children. But here's my own child who's not challenging at all. <laughs> like, no, I had kids that have been, you know, biting, throwing chairs, and I'm like able to be know what to do in that situation. And first of all, anyone who works with kids and has their own kids will tell you that it's a totally different skill set. It's one thing to work with right. a child knowing that there's an end date, another thing that you're the child's parent is totally <laughs> not a transferable skill set. But still I felt like I should be better at it. You know, I had all these shoulds. Right. You know, so the app being able to say, Oh, I these aren't these are just thoughts. These are stories my brain's telling myself, you know, learning how to look at those judgments that my brain was making as like little clouds in the sky and having that metacognition element, you know, um, saying, okay, yeah, that's, that's one interpretation of reality is that I'm not a good mom or that I'm, you know, and I never had guilt about my, my health condition really affecting my parenting. It was more that I felt like I was, you know, it was more that I was getting, my, my therapist taught me that like anxiety can present as irritability. Yeah. Which I was like, oh, that's helpful to know. Cause I kind of thought I was just going from like becoming a bad person. Like, <laughs> I'm like, and I'm anyway, that's a whole, I think the anxiety that I was experiencing was manifest towards irritability, you know, towards my husband, towards my child, you know, and it was such a weird experience to be like, I, the one thing about myself that I've never doubted is my ability to like be a loving person, right? Like I love I would work so well with with children and adults and people that other people found it hard to connect to. But then why am I feeling like a complete bitch, you know, towards yeah. my own husband and my yeah. son? Like I just was really I didn't even realize how much I was struggling until I started feeling better. So so act yes. helped me be like, oh, these are just thought, these are thoughts, these are interpretations our brain's having. And then the commitment piece, the self-compassion came in to help me not feel like a terrible person and then normalizing that suffering and normalizing that these thoughts are part of the human experience, you know, and then, and then committing to, okay, what's still important in my life again, saying like, okay, well it is, you know, I can, I can actually proceed alongside these thoughts, these irritable thoughts or or whatnot, like an anxious thoughts. And I can become, you know, allow them to be like passengers on the bus of my, of my life and still say that I'm, you know, still commit to, it is important to me to, to connect to my, to my spouse, to my child. And I can do that. I don't have to eliminate all these bad thoughts. That's what I thought before. Yeah. I thought I had to eliminate all the bad thoughts and sensations, and then I would be happy because that's kind of how my life was before. So yes. it, it was almost like a strategy that was working before it wasn't working anymore. And I had to change. Yeah. Thanks. So many good things. <laughs> <laughs> But and I, I have some notes and I do want to get to them. But Thank you. you were just saying how like 
we can't get rid of those thoughts anyway. Yes. And and that's what the creator of ACT, Stephen C. Hayes, yeah. talks about a lot, which is no matter what we do, even if we find some like temporary fix, some band-aid that can make us feel good in a moment, like we cannot stop our brains from generating all these negative thoughts time and time again. It's just, that's how our brains work. If that's being human, that's life, it's going to happen. So mm-hmm. knowing that, how do we work with that? Yeah. As opposed yeah. to saying, yeah. we're going to shut this down. We're going to, we have to cut these thoughts off. Yeah. It's a really, it's a deceptively like deep paradigm shift, you know? Yeah. And I really think, I think, you know, the traditional cognitive behavior therapy tool of, you know, make a list of like, what's the evidence for your thought in right. distortion. It really doesn't work for, for a lot of chronic pain related things like catastrophizing stuff. Cause it doesn't yes. like, it just gets you, it gets what you, what Dr. Harris would call it just, and maybe that's what Dr. Hayes would also call it. Cause I know that, they, you know, that he is Dr. Hayes is the originator, but it's called the struggle switch. The struggle yeah. switch is your struggle is the switch that you turn on when you start struggling with or trying to fight your thoughts. So instead of saying, you, you, you know, you explained it perfectly. Instead of saying, well, I got to fix this thought because I have to have happy thoughts and then I'll be happy. <laughs> it's actually happiness is in my case, a result of giving up control, which is like yeah, things like, yeah, control. I love like, that. I'm like, I've never taught my therapist, but I'm really good at being in control. <laughs> Okay, good. To, and, and then why are you here then? But, you know, yeah, like there's a there's a great visual that Dr. Ha- Harris had in the Happiness Trap Illustrated Edition, where someone says they have anxiety, and then they have a swirling tornado above their head. And it, and it says anxiety. And then underneath it is anxiety about anxiety, sadness, <laughs> anger, frustration, guilt. So that's when you're you're anxious, if you're you're not accepting your thoughts, you're just saying, Oh, I'm anxious. I got to do something to fix it. I got to change yeah. it and now, but I'm not, I'm failing. Oh no, I'm failing. It's like how we treat children who are having a tantrum. Mm-hmm. We're like, Oh, calm down. This doesn't, we know it doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. actually work unless the child's only at the beginning stage of escalation. Yeah. It, once they're tr- completely, you know, emotionally flooded, they're not, it's not going to work to take a deep yeah. breath. It's too late. So you actually, it's this radical acceptance is so freeing because you say, yep. And uh, instead of the tornado of thoughts that you have, this, when the struggle switches on, you have the tornado. That's like, I'm, I'm, I'm mad. I'm mad about being mad. I'm sad about being mad. I'm guilty. I'm frustrated. You just say, okay, here's the, here's the feeling. It's anxiety. I don't like it. I don't want it, but I'm not going to struggle with it. And that's like turning the struggle switch off. Yeah. Um, which, so I, I imagine myself doing that. Or there's the finger trap toy. Um, and what it is, is you, you know, if those of you who are just listening to the auditory, it's the, the little plastic or actually wood what is it made out of wood little pieces of i don't know what this is Seems like something but, like oh, paper or wood right paper or wood yeah you put your finger on one side and when you put your finger on the other side let's say the the, the first side that you put your finger in is like the present moment thoughts sensations feelings with the other finger in if you try to fight against those struggle with them you just get more stuck and have more tension but yeah. when you kind of allow it and accept it that you're actually free to get unstuck. So yes. I keep this on my desk, to be honest. To I remind. love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard you say that before. So you picked up the, the little yeah. toy and I was like, there it is. <laughs> it's you are the purple one. Um, when it's, can it's I, I, yeah, no, go, go. Yeah. No, I was going to say, can I highlight something that you said before? Because I think it's so huge yes. for our PMDD listeners. So firstly, everything, this is why I love finding people from all different areas and professions, because Anyone living with any kind of chronic illness, I think, can relate to so much of this. Mm -hmm. And for PMDDers, as we're talking about these negative thoughts and feelings and the catastrophizing and the ruminating, it's all going to keep coming back. So I think Mm -hmm. in general, what we're talking about with ACT is so huge. But you briefly mentioned how ACT helped you in in motherhood and feeling like Mm -hmm. I should be able to deal with this. Why can't I? you know, why am I having these crazy reactions at home? And, you know, PMDD is something that happens to people who are of reproductive age and do have a cycle. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure many of us are dealing with the same sort of parenting challenges. And Mm -hmm. so I just want to highlight that. And thank you for bringing that up. 
because I'm sure so many of us deal with the same challenges. And it's, I found the same thing in my life that the benefits to bringing ACT into my life just kind of stretched far and wide, way beyond what I was expecting it to. Totally. Um, And I'm mindful of time. And I know you have your little one at home. I want to get to a question and also let you, you know, share with the listeners how they can connect with you. Oh, yeah. I'm very curious because you are an OT by profession. And then you have this amazing, like, support and empowerment group for people with RA, how you have found yourself actually implementing those ACT principles with your patients and clients. Yeah. Yeah. So I do, you know, direct in the Room to Thrive program, I do like direct education on these, on what is acceptance and commitment therapy. So like overtly talking about it, right? And just in the same way, my therapist did that with me. And, you know, saying you kind of have to start with it, I think a foundation of just what we're talking about. I I talk about the finger trap toy. I literally brought out the, um, (laughs) the, my notes from my or my uh, slides that I present in like the educational part of my program. And then in our live, so I talk about the exact things we just talked about with the Mm -hmm. struggle switch and talk about acceptance versus resignation. And I, I I built, I built this, what do you call it? Building, building Canva, (laughs) the, you know, photo editing software thing, this tool called like the chronic illness stress decision helper. I didn't really like to make things very wordy. And, and what it is, is it's like a chart. It's like a choose your own adventure chart where I tried to kind of synthesize in one spot to say, okay, when is it appropriate to use different tools? So like I say, is it, is, are you having what's called like a thing? I call it a thinking problem, which is I'm thinking about this in a way that if I think different about this, it will change my relationship to the problem. Like example, that would be like, my thought is that's causing me discomfort is it'll never get better. It'll never get like I'm. I can't or I can't handle this. That's actually a th- a thinking problem that you can employ traditional cognitive behavior therapy, where you say like, okay, we actually don't have evidence that it's never going to get better. We don't know. I'm not. This is not to delude yourself to say it will get better. Right. It, but it's unknowable. The future is unknowable. So we can help ourselves get out of that stuck state by saying, okay, yeah, let's. Could I think differently about this problem? That's a thinking problem. Yeah. And if it's not a thinking problem, that's a, you know, then we either, it's a solvable problem or a perpetual problem. So sol- this is actually st- stealing the language or borrowing or utilizing <laughs> the language from John Gottman, marriage and family therapist, yeah. which turns out this is how lucky of a soul I am. I, my first therapist that I ever went to actually, so I was condensing my story, I had a male therapist and a female therapist. Female therapist is actually the first one I went to when my son was really little. And she is a psychologist. She's second author on John Gottman. He's the world what? renowned. Yeah, she's got her PhD under him. And so <laughs> I went to her because I thought she was a two for one deal because I was having issues again with, I knew it wasn't, it was something was wrong in my brain. It felt like I was like, why am I feeling rage towards my husband, this person who I know that I love? But I'm like, yeah. it's again, I didn't realize anxiety can manifest as like irritability. So I was like, this is just weird. This isn't me. I'm not myself. Right. So anyway, but she's, she's, she recommended I read the seven principles to make marriage work by John Gottman. And in that book, he talks, talks in marriages about the marriages that are most successful are not the ones where there's the least conflict. It's the ones where people accept that, that some of the problems in their marriage are unsolved or perpetual and some are solvable. And they only focus on solving the solving problems and they accept the perpetual ones. And I was like, that really changed my mind or blew my mind. I kept telling him first, I'm like, this sounds like settling. Like, I'm not so sure about this. Again, like, <laughs> an optimist. Like, but over time, I realized what a what a helpful uh, perspective that is. So in, I, I implemented that in my program. In your rheumatoid arthritis journey, your chronic health journey, or maybe your PMDD journey, some of your problems are going to be solvable and some of them are not. Yeah. And so when you have a perpetual problem, we have to learn how to work around it and cope with it. And that's when we employ like the ACT strategies and self-compassion. And then if it is a solvable program, then we give you the tools in the case of arthritis, like, you know, pain management and fatigue management tools. Let's use those tools if they help, but they don't always help. Right. <laughs> we have to learn. Yeah, we deal with that uncertainty. So that's kind of the framework. And I and in 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 room to thrive, 
Thrive is an acronym for like the T is tools for pain and fatigue. H is the healthy habits like nutrition, exercise, sleep. And then R is relationships and social life. I is inner world. So that's where we talk about this part. And then V is values and valued activities, which is the, the you know values part of ACT. And then E is executive functions, like the adulting skills or the CEO skills of being a chronic illness patient, like symptom tracking and stuff like mm. that. So that's how it all kind of weaves together. Yes. And then we just help each other. We help to point out like, wow, it sounds like you're in the struggle switch, you know, when we're in the live group, like it sounds yeah. like the struggle switch might be turned on. Like, what would it look like to not turn it on? You know, like just say, yes. yeah, like, yeah, your friends and family won't get it sometimes. Like, I'm not going to teach you, like, I could, I, I could teach you till I'm right in the face ways to try to get someone else to get it. But if someone doesn't want to get something, they're not going to get it. We have to accept that, you know, so things like that. Yes. I love this so much. It's so fun. Yeah. Okay. So Cheryl, first, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to share? No, not, not reasonably. Okay. (laughs) And my doctor's like, what else is bothering you? And I'm like, how much time do you have? I love that so much. All day. No, just just kidding. No, thank you. Well, I have had so much fun chatting with you and I'm sure, you, you know, if you'd like to, I'm sure we can do this another time because I told, yeah. I'm, I'm serious that I love talking about this. So yeah, yes, please. Totally. Anytime. So then where can listeners connect with you if they want to learn more yes. and, you know, listen to your podcast and hook up with your group and stuff? Yeah. So my website is arthritis.theenthusiasticlife.com. That's the full URL. All of my social media handles are different. So little free business advice. Don't recommend (laughs) that. So it's just, I started them at different times. And but the one I'm most active on is Instagram. And that's arthritis underscore life underscore Cheryl with a CH. Okay. And then I do share a name with a famous singer. So if you're trying to Google something with me, I recommend putting it in quotations, Cheryl Crow with a CH and then whatever it is you're trying to look for, like arthritis, you know, but and on I am pretty active also on TikTok, just arthritis life on TikTok. And uh, but the website's the best way to get a hold of me or my email is um, info at myarthritislife.net. So myarthritislife.net redirects to my longer website title. So anyway. (laughs) Perfect. Um, and yeah, I love I love chatting with people. I don't I am I struggle sometimes with my executive functions with regards to like responding to messages and stuff. So please don't feel bad if I don't respond to you. Just I'm I'm happy for you to send ping me again because I'm still working on. I say in 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 the growth mindset, I would say I'm working on developing systems <laughs> and and I know I need to delegate more. I'm working mm, on it. Yeah. I'm working on delegating because right now I am like I'm very multi passionate as you can you know tell, but I'm I, I kinda tend to burn myself out and like say yes to too many things. So I'm working on that. So but that's yeah, that's uh, how you can get a hold of me. I'm sure on that I can relate. I yes. totally relate to like the follow up thing. People are like, Oh, oh I'm so sorry to you know yeah. bother you about X and I'm like no bother me I love it follow up harass please me please follow <laughs> up yeah no I yeah please h- help me help me remember to help you yeah, yeah help me help you because um, it's just hard yeah and I will be making sure to get all your key links and put them in the show notes to oh, make perfect. it easy for the listeners as well that's nice yeah um, and my podcast is just called arthritis life podcast by the way so if you look. Okay. Put arthritis life into your podcast platform. It will show up, by the way. (laughs) Arthritis life. And otherwise, if you're just Googling, uh, that's what I tend to do. I do Cheryl with a C, Crow, arthritis. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And then I find you. And it helps if you put it into quotation marks and you're less likely to have like this famous singer. or Yeah. Actually, yeah. If you do Cheryl Crow in quotations arthritis, the first thing that comes up is my my bio on my own website. That's Fantastic. good. Actually. The second thing is Instagram. That's so Fantastic. interesting. I didn't even do it. I didn't even Google myself. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but if you don't put it in quotations, it's going to just show up a lot of people with <laughs> spelling, spelling the famous singer's wrong, name wrong. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much for being here with me today. Oh this my is gosh. so fun. I loved chatting with you. Oh, thank you. I really did too. I would love to have you on my podcast too sometime and talk about PMDD because it's not something that I've covered, but I know people have lots of questions about it. So that would be awesome. Yeah. Yay. All okay. Right. Bye bye for now. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked the show, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For links to everything mentioned in this episode, 
you can check out the show notes. And you can find me, Diane DeJesus, on Instagram at Mindfulness for PMDD. Now, I invite you to pause, take a breath, and look around. Mm-hmm.